All right, everybody, we are back. I am Jack Murphy. This is the Jack Murphy Live Show, and this is episode number 90. It's crazy. We've been doing this for three years now, episode number 90. And if you count in the uh, shows that I did with uh, two and three people, the Friday sessions and stuff, I think we're up to about 100 now. We'll be celebrating soon, coming up. Today, I am really excited to have Dr. Katherine Shanahan on. She is the author of this book, Deep Nutrition. She is also the author of this book, The Fat Burn Fix. She is a physician. She's a nutritionist. She's been a consultant to professional sporting teams like the Los Angeles Lakers. She's an entrepreneur and activist. She's got a new project called Zero Acre. We're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about seed oils, the food industrial pharmacological complex. <laughs> Why everybody is so fat and sick? Hopefully we'll come up with some answers. Again, get the book, Deep Nutrition, Dr. Kate Shanahan. Welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Hi, Jack. I'm good. Thank you for bringing me on to your show. <laughs> your audience. I'm excited. I think the audience is going to be very excited about this too. We are all of the sort of people that uh, don't take the answers that people give us for granted. We go out there, we find exactly what we're needing to find. We find the truth. Um, I'm, you know, it's funny because I'm Gen X, right? So I'm thinking about growing up in a sea of lies, basically, right? Low fat. Good for you. My mom made me TV dinners because she thought that that was like the future and something cool. Man, look at this. You put it in this fancy new, look, hey, we got this microwave thing. It's pretty cool, right? I remember them very uh, explicitly and clearly telling me only eat three eggs a week. Otherwise, you're going to get a heart attack. Basically, everything that we were told was a lie on so many different levels especially people like me growing up in the eighties and like all this, all these lies that are now just coming to light. It seems like, and we're just peeling them away one by one in so many different areas, including health and nutrition. And, you know, I've been, I have all these notes, Kate, I was going to go through all this long journey and all this to lead up to the punchline, but I want to just jump right out with the, with the big question. Uh, let's not even take it easy at all. I mean, you have been, you're out there, you're challenging the uh, industrial complex, agricultural complex, you know, big pharma, you know, the universities, Harvard. And I have a question for you. Why does it seem like big farm, big ag, big medicine, big universities, they all seem to want to keep us fat, dumb, and sick. Is this right? And why? <laughs> That is the right impression, and it's because that's the model that we've all kind of uh, gr gravitated towards with, I'm not going to say capitalism, but I'm our particular brand of technology worshiping capitalism, uh, starting with, the reason I highlight the, the role of technology is starting in the 1950s with the whole better living through chemistry era, right? We had just won World War II with a lot of cool technological stuff. And uh, wow, technology seemed to have the answer for everything. So technology also had the answer for what was a healthy diet. Mm. And that is where um, the processed food companies started taking control of the conversation around nutrition from everyone else from doctors from chefs from your grandmother from the people who actually were healthy and actually understood what a healthy meal looked like and should be comp composed of so starting in the 1950s our model moved away from our model with health and you know the medical system really moved away from just kind of like old fashioned common sense medicine uh let you know support your body with uh you know, what they would didn't use the term, but like natural mechanisms like with good food, right? Good nutrition. Same way that people more had a farming mentality, really, because there were so many Americans who were farmers um, in the 1900s, and they knew it was important to feed the animals right, or they would get sick and die. So we completely severed that relationship after World, World War II. 
with any kind of past thinking about nutrition because who, why? Because the American Heart Association got money from Procter and Gamble that needed to sell their cottonseed oil and they found the perfect mouthpiece for that in the form of the American Heart Association's leadership who they needed money. The American Heart Association had been a tiny little organization of mostly doctors who specialized in heart disease and they they were underfunded they just they got money from other doctors from dues membership dues and they said well if we want to do any serious research that's going to require money and they sold their soul to the devil because the first place they got money from was procter and gamble and it was no small potatoes <laughs> it was um the whole enchilada <laughs> That's mm-hmm. a terrible mixed metaphor. <laughs> um, it was like $1.7 million. And it, like in today's money, that's at least 10 times that much, right? So mm-hmm. a massive amount of money. And uh, from there, it was all downhill with not just the American Heart Association, because you know most listeners out there might think like, oh, I, I think I heard of that. They do fundraisers, right? They actually do way more than that. The American Heart Association has a lockdown on the nutrition conversation. They have a lockdown on the nutrition education that doctors get. And all those things that you said that we grow up, grew up as Gen X, because I was like Gen X-ish. I was kind of between Gen X and baby boomer, really old. Um, (laughs) But all all those things that you said, like we're starting to peel away the lies, they're not being peeled away from medical education. They're not being peeled away from what your typical dietitian or nutritionist will learn. And they're really not being peeled away very much, even from like functional medicine and alternative health very much at all, because that is the best funded message. And um, and it's one that we Amer- as Americans have been told is, uh, a direction that we ought to go, which is more technology, more time-saving, convenient things, right? Because it's all about processed food, really. That's what it. That's what all of these. If you want to put in a, in a uh, one tiny little nutshell, what are all these nutrition directives having you do? Eat more processed food, <laughs> because processed food is made out of basically three ingredients. And the worst of all is the seed oils or the vegetable oils that came from Procter and Gamble's input into the American Heart Association and hasn't gone away. Their input and influence is incredibly powerful and is basically still controlling, entirely controlling the nutrition conversation. But it's appealing to our worst natures too. So like, I'm not saying it's it's your fault as a consumer, but I'm saying don't let them like, make you lazy (laughs) because if you want convenience if you want to live off powders it's so convenient and it's so cheap but it's so unhealthy you will not be well you will get sick you will get sicker and sicker until you eventually die from complications of eating processed foods right so um but along the way you'll be a great consumer you'll be buying a lot of junk foods you'll be hungry all the time so you'll be doing what we were supposed to do after uh, after nine one one. They I, remember they told us the economy was tanking. They said go out there and buy things, right. guys. Right. Don't do anything like responsible or better yourself or anything. Just go out and buy whatever, buy anything. We don't care. Just to buy stuff. And so like that is so ingrained in our culture, and we're not thinking about what is the quality of the food at all. And that discussion has been, uh, you know, it's it's just kind of bubbling up from the surface now. And I like to think that I've been helping it bubble, but it really needs to do more than just percolate it. It really needs to take over the airwaves because this is what is killing us. And, you know, people are make, getting rich off of it. So it's not going to stop itself. Like you can appeal to the government. You can appeal to like uh, medical associations. You can you know, do that, but it's gonna, it's not gonna do it, the, the thing. The thing that needs to happen is really just like consumers uh, have a lot more power than they realize. If they stop buying processed food and start prioritizing eating real food, uh, it's not easy to do. 
it's not like you can just snap your fingers and suddenly have a meal made for you. But if you want to be healthy, that's a, a place that you want to aim for. And we can pretend that's not the case to our detriment. And we'll end up, you know, sick on multiple medications. The average person over 65 is on nine prescriptions and has had at least three surgeries and been in the hospital um, more than once. So, uh, you know, usually for something like a heart attack or a heart attack scare or a stroke or some major organ failing and needing to be removed or fixed in some way. I'm not talking about like accidents, right? That happens right. too. Right. And we do great with patching people back together after accidents. But uh, most of the rest of what, what happens in a hospital is not something I'm very proud of. Right. Uh, Especially you know, car I, I just... Yards. I just had a, a, I tore my pec last summer and I had surgery and everything about that process was fantastic. I mean, they knocked me out. It was amazing. The guy did his carpentry work. It was amazing. I did my physical therapy. It was amazing. And within six, eight months, I'm totally back to normal. Everything's great. So in that regard, you're right. The like putting people back together, repair work. I mean, even though it's still pretty crude, I mean, there's like actually just like screws and like hangers in my bones, you know, um, <laughs> It's effective, right? It's very effective. But when it comes to nutrition and even exercise science and, and whatnot, as somebody who's been myself, who's been digging deep into all these issues and trying to learn and educate myself as best as possible, it strikes me that we don't necessarily know everything yet. Uh, and it seems as though we're on a journey, right? So one of the questions I wanted to get to I'm jumping ahead here. But one of the questions I wanted to get to was on this discovery process of how the body works, how nutrition works, how what we eat affects us, how it even affects our, our ability to reproduce and what our children look like. What, how far down the, like, if there's a point at the end of the path where you stand there and you're like, we understand everything now. Like, how far are we along that process? Because I feel like there's something new every day that changes what we thought yesterday and continues to force us to rethink our worldview. So how far down this discovery process of figuring out how the body works and interacts with food and its environment are we, do you think? Um, the, that's, that is the reason I wrote Deep Nutrition is because of that apparent lack of solid direction to go. Um, as far as what to eat, we really, I mean, that's, that's not that complicated. That we have some great answers for. That's what I put in deep nutrition, but it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, based on like the latest, what a dietitian would say, oh, you need to have a double blind, you know, controlled trial. Uh, that is insanity. We are a species that lives an average of 75 years. So that would, you know, we would have to wait quite a long time. Um, then there's the additional fact of generational inputs. There's at least three generations that, that of, of nutrition that we know impact your health very powerfully. That's from the science of epigenetics. And uh, so that adds, I'm going to triple that, right? So that's an insane way of thinking. And we don't need to do that. We just don't. The problem with nutrition science, and I'm going to I'm going to tell you this, and this is what deep nutrition really is based on. The problem with nutrition science is it has no philosophy, no grounding in any kind of um, philosophy other than technology is pretty good. Like, let's try to use that as whenever we can to prove our point or to, you know, uh, invent a new expensive drug or biohack a new expensive supplement or device that's going to, you know, we can market, right? That's, that is the philosophy. Now that philosophy will kill you. The philosophy that we used to have was very common sense. And that's what I put in deep nutrition. That philosophy is this it's very simple. We ought to eat the same way that our healthy ancestors ate because that is probably an indication that they ate well, and in addition, the reason I put, so that's deep nutrition. That's the deep nutrition philosophy. It's part of a larger way of thinking about human health. That is a, it's a, it's a movement that's been around for a while and is growing called the ancestral health movement. 
And if you wanted to describe the ancestral health movement, I couldn't think of a better way than what, kind of what I just said, which is really, <laughs> we ought to eat the way our ancestors ate. because They were healthier than us. We're doing bad. Uh, they did great. You know, some of them, not all. Some people died of accidents. Some people died in childbirth. Some people were malnourished. But in general, they did so much better. I mean, they, people like Lewis and Clark, people like uh, the, you know, the geniuses that, like, that founded our country, right? Uh, the, the strongest people in history, the Genghis Khan, the toughest badasses you can think of, they ate the way, they ate according to deep nutrition principles. They all ate the same kind of diet in terms of the strategies of how to maximize their nutrition from the natural world. They didn't use processed foods. They didn't use synthetic vitamins. They didn't use, uh, they weren't vegans. And they, uh, but they, they all did the same kinds of things to fortify their body with the absolute best foods and best nutrition. And they were so healthy. And that's what I, I break it down a little bit in deep nutrition. Like, how do you really even define health, right? That's an important question that I think is not been part ever a part of the medical conversation. They don't talk about that. What is health? They talk about what is this disease? Mm. <laughs> and usually the answer is we don't really know <laughs> when it's not an infectious disease or a broken bone or, you know, something obvious like a heart attack or a stroke. But even those, they don't really understand why those happen. So they, they are not in a position to tell us what to eat because they have not even studied what is health? What is the goal here? What is the goal? As far as they're concerned, it's all about heart attacks because that's the entire nutrition conversation has been centered around cholesterol and keeping that cholesterol low so you supposedly will, will be protected from having a heart attack. And it's all about that. They don't talk about what to eat to prevent cancer in medical school or dietitians. They've got some like loose ideas about, you know, anti-inflammatory foods and antioxidants, and making sure you get like basic vitamins. But it's not like preventing cancer really isn't like my ideal, right? I want to be healthy. I want right. to be vital. I want to be strong. I, I, I wanted to, when I was in college, not have injuries all the time that would sideline me from my my track running. I was on a scholarship, which I almost lost because I kept getting injured. And I, no one could explain why. Well, that was, I, I found out why. And, and it has to do with my diet. And it has to do with how diet changes your connective tissue, this stuff that makes your joints strong. So our diet in this country does not support healthy connective tissue. That's just one example of the kind of stuff we need to understand and we need to we need to know what that means when your diet doesn't support healthy connective tissue that means that you will see more athletic injuries in children than you you know with each passing generation and you will see more athletic injuries in children happening earlier than ever and that's exactly what's happening in the sports world um they're finding that there's this uh, like baseball take for example there's this show elbow. This is the elbow. I'm a doctor. Um, there's this <laughs> elbow surgery Tommy, Tommy John, sure. <laughs> called, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. That is most commonly now performed in children. And the doctors are like, oh, well, they're just training harder and their growth plates aren't solid. No. I mean, kids would play really hard back when I was a kid. You know, they would play all day. They didn't necessarily have organized sports and so much maybe repetitive stuff. But, um, but the injuries now that we're seeing are way out of proportion in children um, and a younger and younger professional athletes are having to get the surgery. It used to be over age 30 for, you know, the most common average age for Tommy John. Um, and now I believe it's like 27. So it's just that that's because our connective tissue is what makes our joints strong. Our connective tissue is like what are, that's the term for like ligaments and mm -hmm. tendons and um, synovial fluid, even the stuff that's supposed to lubricate your joints and nourish your, your, the bones of your joints and your cartilage and just keep everything lubricated and like running smooth and painless, right? 
So when you don't have anything in your diet that specifically supports connective tissue, because all of our ancestors did, they had something called bone broth, bone stock, uh, collagen-based foods. That's not part of the American diet. That's why, that's one of the big reasons why we are seeing children feel like their grandparents in their 20s while their grandparents are in their 60s. And sometimes their grandparents are surpassing them in their capability to, to be active. Like that happens in my own family. My mom has fantastic knees, but my sister's son is already having knee pain and he's like eight. Hmm. The, you don't know this about me, but uh, I'm a big baseball fan and I, I coached baseball and my son is a, is a high performing baseball athlete on his way to top D1 school to pitch. And so this subject of uh, early onset of Tommy John surgery is something, I mean, we don't have any symptoms of that. He doesn't, but you know, the idea that kids, and I know this, what you said to be true is that Tommy John, the tear of the ulnar uh, tendon is happening more frequently. Uh, and younger, and uh, they do attribute it to overuse, overworking, uh, you know, playing baseball all year round, et cetera. But uh, this is fascinating to me that uh, it could be dietary based. And uh, luckily, you know, in our house, we eat a lot of chicken off the bone. We eat a lot of steak with the bone in it. And we eat all kinds of foods that are lined up in both the fat burn fix and in deep nutrition. So we're most of, we're most of the way there. And it's no surprise that, you know, my son's 6'4", 200 at age 15 and healthy as can be because he eats, he eats very, very well. Uh, I'm not sure he even understands how well he eats these days. Um, but uh, that I'm going to start feeding him more uh, bone broth, too, now that you mentioned that. Um what you what you said about science, technology, uh, the allure of like trying to make everything better through science. Uh, for my audience, which definitely skews conservative, you know, we, we can see that application in all areas of life, like a progressive mindset around government and people and humans and, you know, going beyond human you know, beings into like uh, cyborg things and also perfecting the world <laughs> out there in the other, you know, in other countries, like spreading our ideas to their countries and making them do what we want them to do. Like we know better, right? So this, we're, we're, my audience is very familiar with this. We know better vibe. Now I can also understand how in the forties and fifties, you know, it was the dawn of the nuclear age and we had just won the world war and, you know, uh, it really did. I, I would, I understand how you could get swept up in the notion that you can transform everything to be better through science. Absolutely. Oh man. Now we're going to the, going into space and what does the astronaut bring with them into space? But Tang, man, Tang must be the best thing ever. If that's what the astronauts are, are you know, I remember this as a kid, right? So once, you know, big industry and ag and farm, they all have these ideas of making money, of course. And there's also well-spirited innovators within those industries as well. So I, I can, I can see how like the initial thrust into these terrible eating habits and mass manufacturing of these poisons basically could have been done without malevolence, let's say. But at this point now, at this point now, it's been so long. The obesity epidemic is so obvious and plain in front of all of our eyes. The top, what, 10 or 11 causes of death are metabolically health related. You have COVID come along, which basically is like a metabolic health per like killer, right? If you are metabolically unhealthy, it's, you're, it's going to kill you. All this, all this evidence is just staring you in the face. So is the industry now malevol malevolently complicit? Like, do they know? And are they hiding it? And are they still pushing this forward despite, despite the evidence being pretty clear? I absolutely think the answer to that has to be yes. I mean, you know, I, I obviously don't have a lot of personal insider knowledge, but I I've been studying the American Heart Association and what they do for a long time. So on the medical side of things, I think that they are they they have to know. Um, and I'll I'll tell you why I think that in a second. But also on the um just the food science side of things, 
they have to know. I mean, they have to know. And and I have some, I do have some insider, some industry insider information that helps uh, kind of support that. So starting with like the the medical science side of things. So for one thing, um, the idea that high cholesterol is a health threat was never proven before the American Heart Association just started saying it like it was common like fact, like it just was had been proven. There were initially many, many prominent doctors um, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s who strongly objected to what the American Heart Association was saying. Um, and prominent people, really like connected people, like the one of the biggest um, human health studies ever done, it's still ongoing, is called the Framingham Health Studies, named after a town in Massachusetts where they've been studying generation after generation now what they eat and you know whether they have heart attacks and different health outcomes. The, the nutrition anal analyst in the 70s of the Framingham study said that we've spent $20 million now in 20 years uh, throwing money at the idea, trying to prove that this is true, trying to prove that high cholesterol causes heart attacks. And so far we have no actual evidence. So the only way that now that generation of doctors has died out. So there's very few doctors who now are actively practicing that have that like palpable experience with hearing any other side of the story from anyone they could, you know, see as a leader in the field. Um, and now all of the leaders in the field are in seemingly in lockstep with the American Heart Association. And even though there still is no evidence, in fact, there are periodically, there's about 20 different um, journals, articles that have been published that's, that say that there is no evidence that eating saturated fat, raising your cholesterol causes heart problems. Th that the American Heart Association always like downplays those. They ignore that. That is sign number one. Um, another sign is. Um, that when evidence to the contrary, like not just that their statement isn't true, that the hypothesis is saturated fat cholesterol clog arteries, uh, right? And so the first thing is, well, that hasn't been proven. So essentially, we are all living in an experimental diet that, um, you know, that if you look at the data of G, you see that it's leaning towards really bad idea. That's what we've done, and we're all getting sick now. Um, whether you know it or not, you're not eating saturated fat. That's what I talk about in the fat burn fix. You're eating a lot of seed oils. So, but the second, so that's like one kind of line of thinking, right? Has it, has it ever been proven? The answer is no. 20 articles on that. Has it ever been disproven? Well, yes. And one of the largest and best nutrition studies ever done disproved it. Was it published? No. <laughs> Why not? What was the excuse? Well, you know, those people who did it are dead now, but like the son of one of them is also a physician. And his answer was, I remember my dad saying like, this, this outcome is just like so bizarre. I don't understand. It's not what we expect. So they just didn't publish it. So you might think, okay, plausible deniability there so far. But listen to this, okay? <laughs> this part is no more plausible deniability. In 2016, that study was analyzed and finally did get published. And it said, hey, everybody, this hypothesis that more saturated fat causes more heart attacks and more polyunsaturated fat from seed oils causes fewer. Uh, actually, we have great data that says that's a terrible idea. You actually get more cancer. Uh, you, some people, some groups get more heart attacks. They die younger. And um, wow, that's a big deal. And oh, P.S. This was like hidden. We could have uh, known about this back in 1980 or the late 70s, and because uh, it was called like the Minnesota Coronary Experiment. It was never, never properly published. It was eventually published in like, but they didn't talk about the actual findings. Um, I don't know how they can get away with that. Anyway, um, 
So, but in 2016, a uh, doctor named uh, Dr. Ramsden from the National Institute of Health, you know, really respectable guy, National Institute of Health, uh, dug up the old data and analyzed it and published it and said, this kind of should change everything. And as you know, you're not really allowed to say stuff like that in a scientific journal, but he came as close to saying, wow, this is incredible. We've been making a big mistake. Hello, everybody, wake up. Let's stop making this recommendation to cut saturated fat and even worry much about cholesterol and start and eat more seed oils. And so what does the American Heart Association say about that? Like, because at this point, if they deny that, then I think there's something really wrong with them. And yes, they denied that. So Walter Willett, who was, you know, from, he's not uh, like the leader of the American Heart Association, but he's heavily invested in all their research. He gets funding from them and they rely on each other. Harvard and the American Heart Association are like connected at the hip in terms of nutrition. And so um, Harvard is like, uh, Walter Willett is Harvard's like dean of a major school. He's, he's got like a school named after him. He's that influential. Uh, and he said, well, it's just in, about this article that should change everything. He said, interesting historical footnote. Anywho, you know, don't, whatever you do, uh, don't eat butter and keep eating more seed oils and um, get on a statin for crying out loud if your cholesterol is like, you know, barely above like what would have considered extremely low, would have been considered extremely low when I first started practicing, which is 70. If you're a diabetic, you have to have cholesterol under 70. You have to be on a statin unless your cholesterol is already under 70, which is insane. That's insane. Low cholesterol is actually a, a risk factor for really bad health. The lower your cholesterol, once you're over 65, the more likely you are to die, period. The more likely you are to die of infectious disease, dementia, and cancer. No. So, not cool. Not cool. <clears throat> Not cool at all. And for longtime listeners of the podcast, this is yet another example here of how our institutions, all of them are corrupted. They all have drifted away from their missions, these long, long-term institutions. They, their preference is to stay funded, to stay alive, to, to, to just exist rather than achieve the mission. And that's why networks, building networks is important, right? You rise, networks rise to serve a purpose. If they provide a utility, then they stay together. If they don't, then they fall apart. And you, another reason why you also just have to be in charge of your own health, uh, and not listen to, you know, we, we, we've learned over time that the big universities and big in the big associations, you know, the AMA, even the AMA, not necessarily looking out for everybody's best interests. And we can see, uh, how politicized it's become and the attack, uh, you know, from our angle here on young boys and just young male behavior and such, it's, it's really quite ridiculous. Uh, one of the issues, you know, topics that you brought to light in your book that I haven't read too much about, and I don't understand too much about, and I'd like to is epigenetics. Um, when I was going through school, I don't think I learned too much about this in the nineties. Maybe I did, maybe it just passed through me and I didn't pay attention. Um, but it, it struck me as relatively new and perhaps controversial. So could you, uh, just give us like a quick couple minute primer on epigenetics, because I have follow on questions that are specific to your content, uh, that will lead, lead from there. Great. Yeah. So it is a new science. It's, it's, um, first we sequenced the genome and uh we thought that was going to give us all the answers I, I like if i don't know if you remember in the 80s um there was this project the human genome project which uh doesn't see did not sequence all of our dna but just the active parts like what we thought were the active parts the genes um the genes are the things that like make protein that tell your cells how to make the proteins that your cells actually make but epigenetic then we did that and we're like gosh well what turns what makes a cell what makes like an eyeball cell different from say a liver cell? Well, it turns out that the answer to that is what regulates gene expression, what determines which genes get turned on and off in which cell. And epigenetics is part of the answer to that question. So is it a fringy thing? No, no, no. It's like the main thing now in genetics. It's kind of like 
the back in the eighties, they were just starting to understand it. I was actually a, a geneticist at um, Cornell going, I went to a PhD program um, at Cornell to become a geneticist and to be able to engineer genes. I thought that was a great idea. It sounded like a great idea. Um, I dropped out. Um, so <laughs> so I, did, I decided it, we, this is too complicated. We actually are never going to get anywhere with this. Uh, so like I was wrong. I mean, GMOs are not a huge thing, but they're kind of bad. They're, they're not really helping anything. Um, so, so, but you know, I was at that point in time, the science of epigenetics was just kind of really being born. And, um, and it was showing that genes are regulated. And what I wrote about in deep nutrition is, is, is the coolest part of epigenetics. And that is, it doesn't, epigenetics doesn't just determine which genes get turned on in which cell. Epigenetics actually connects your DNA to your diet. It can, that means it connects your DNA to the outside world. And the thing I think is so cool about that is it means that every cell in your body is really kind of dependent on the outside world, the health of the ecosystem out there. Are you accessing a healthy ecosystem when you eat? Or are you accessing a food desert when you eat? Because your genes are dependent on the healthy ecosystem. And if all you get is a food desert, you can't be healthy. And the worst part is that this sort of, alt it, it alters the function of your genes and it can be passed on in generations uh, down to the next generation. For example, limiting the height of your son, right? If you didn't have a good diet, uh, and your wife didn't have a good diet and she didn't have a good diet. Like there's a lot of different ways where you can kind of make up for it. But if nobody had a good diet um, and your grand, your parents and grandparents didn't have a good diet, you would not have a six foot four son. How tall? I'm assuming, are you six foot four? I am. Yeah. So you would, you would have a son that was shorter than you or possibly ha was your height, but had really thin bones. Uh, um, Kind of like spindly looking right instead of being you know having this robust uh skull structure that men are supposed to have compared to women and um you know men are supposed to look different than women right i, I mean i think your listeners probably accept that <laughs> um it's not a uh it's not a choice it's biology <laughs> yeah. um and they are when i say supposed to i mean so that they can be fully met so that they can be healthy and i don't mean like they should be, you know, beating their wives kind of men. I don't mean that. I don't mean like that's not a full male. Like I don't mean you have to like drive a truck. I don't mean you can't be smart and be a nerd, right? Uh, uh, I mean to have the physical structure and physique that makes you stronger than a woman so that you don't have to uh, claim that you're a woman to win, win a swimming race, right? Like those guys. Indeed. Oh, God. So. So this is coming from epigenetics. It's epi the science of epigenetics that's helping us understand these transgenerational connections to what our parents ate and our grandparents ate and even the environment that they lived in, whether th that environment was conducive to health. So my grandparents on my mom's side were like in Russia, they were like Russian Jews and one of the most fertile like parts of Russia. So my grandmother like just died after surviving COVID. She also survived uh, the, the Spanish influenza in 26, no, 7, 1960, 1918. I don't know. There we go. You got it. So she was, she was 104 and she was like with it until pretty much like the last year. And she had lost her hearing and I think kind of eventually lose your mind if you can't hear and really engage with people for a while. So, but I mean, she was like gardening when she was a hundred, she danced the foxtrot on her hundredth birthday. Right. So, and, and, and my mom is like almost 80 and she is moving thousand pound rocks in her yard. Oh, and doing drywall. Okay. Yeah, she's a little crazy, but She's very strong because of that. Now me, no, uh-uh, that didn't happen to me because my mom was not breastfed. My mom grew up in post-war Europe where the, the farms had been destroyed by 
all the, you know, the World War II battles. So the food was terrible. And, uh, and then she read a book called Diet for a Small Planet, which is basically go vegan. You know, don't worry about getting enough protein. You basically don't, you know, it's so easy. Just eat peanut butter and bread. And you're going to have enough protein. So we were all relatively deprived in protein. We were eating seed oils because my dad was a doctor and he was learning that margarine was healthier than butter, right? So I was plagued with injuries from pretty much the first year I started trying to really use my body like an athlete. When I was a cross country runner, I was really good because I have giant lungs, <laughs> but uh, right, I had the advantage of like getting air, so much air, and I have giant lungs and I have a large heart. So even though I was, my body was falling apart, when I was able to run, I was really fast. Right. So I felt like so frustrated because I was on scholarships. I was invited to um, the Olympic trials in uh 1980 but i could i couldn't do all that well because i just kept getting all these injuries so it was very frustrating and i wanted to go actually to medical school to cornell first to solve that problem i wanted to be a geneticist to find out what was wrong with my dna <laughs> um so i could like modify my dna and fix everything and then of course i realized wait it's not possible so genes are cool but we can't like technology is not that cool yet i mean i don't think it'll ever get there but even with crispr but um, so um, I, uh, I left uh, Cornell to go to medical school and see if there was something I might learn there about like, why did I have shin splints all the time? Why was I always getting tendonitis? Why was I injured all the time? And I had friends who, um, who like <laughs> never trained even. And just like one of them like upped and ran a hundred mile race. And I mean, he trained a little, but he didn't train for that. And he didn't have any injuries. He was just tired. And I was like, why? What is the difference? And the answer, I, I did not learn in medical school, but I did learn, and I put this in demutrition. It comes down to that connective tissue and that my dad and mom were eating this, the standard American definition of a healthy diet. That family that I'm talking about where there were seven children and they, they were all like massive mega athletes and, um, and like really good looking too, which, you know... <laughs> I wish I was better looking in high school. I, I was born like with the body of an 80 year old, <laughs> right? I don't have like a long you know, feminine waist or anything, but this family did, all the girls did. And, um, and uh, uh, they had the wide hips. And I, I was like, wow, they look better. They function better. But I didn't learn anything about like how that equates to healthier, better athleticism in medical school or anywhere. I didn't learn anything about that until I started looking into epigenetics and some old fashioned ideas about what nutrition is. And I lived in Hawaii and it kind of all came together because Hawaii is like a snapshot of back in time. It's a window back a hundred years ago, really, because until the seventies, they, they like, electricity was not common. So people couldn't even like refrigerate their food. They had to be completely self-sufficient, almost completely self-sufficient. And the islands were verdant, right? There was, you could hunt wild pig and wild game that they had put there. Um, you could hunt, use fish, raise, you could fish, you could raise chickens, fresh vegetables are year round. So people were massively healthy. And I was coming to realize that they ate wildly wild foods. They ate wild foods compared to what I ate, like goat leg and um, mushy weird things made out of organs. And um, yeah, so I was getting a picture, starting to get a picture back in 2001 that things were just starting to crystallize, like there's more going on here. And what really pushed me over the edge was getting an injury myself. And then I couldn't actually do anything other than I couldn't exercise anymore and I had to do something with my time. And so I started looking into old nutrition books and I found um, the best one ever written uh, by a dentist named Weston A. Price. Do you think like people in your audience might have been, have you introduced your audience to him before? I, I have sure. not, but I read so about him in your book. Okay, great. So he's um, an adventurer. I think he was a dentist who became an adventurer because his philosophy was so wonderful. It was that he was a dentist and he was like, why is it that humans have crooked teeth and cavities, 
And when you look at all other animals, because like he had grown up and spent many years hunting and basically living self-sufficiently in Southern Canada for a long time. Um, and so he looked at the animals and they were all like a pristine health, right? Teeth wise, right? Um, and uh, so he was like, why is it that people don't have straight teeth? That seems weird. And he also realized that while he was hunting in Canada and living off the land, lots of wild game, um, he felt better. And then when he went back to his practice in Ohio and started eating more, at that time, processed food was just starting to enter the food supply. And even that little bit, he noticed the refined flours and sugars, and there were seed oils back then. Um, that little bit started to take a toll on him. And he was like, hmm. And he had this stroke of genius idea, which was, I need to find a healthy human control population mm. that hasn't started adopting these foods that's still living self-sufficiently off the land in some fashion. Um, you know, whether it, by, by in some fashion, I mean, like whether it's no matter where, like anywhere, could be Hawaii, could be Alaska, could be Switzerland. And, um, and if, because if that group that has not been introduced to what he called the foods of civilization, which at that point were mostly just like refined flour, sugars, and vegetable oils, mostly some tinned meat that didn't have, like it was overheated and not so great. Um, that, that were free of that, if they had better teeth, then that's a control group because they're presumably, and this was his big hypothesis, getting better nutrition. So heroically, even though he was like this dumpy guy in this, like, I don't know, he looked like he was 50 and 60 or something like that when he got started um, and never ridden a donkey, <laughs> he <laughs> went to all these out of the way places that you can only access by donkey and brought like a camera and like stuff for some analyzing the vitamin concentration of the foods and performed this incredible feat of data uh, collection and analysis. He went to 11 places and indeed found that where people were eating their traditional like uh, foods, they're just following a traditional food ways. So the term food ways is, is like, the description for what you eat and how you grow it mingled together, right? So if it was farming, what did you do to fortify the soil that your yeah. food was coming from, right? So all these considerations that goes into food ways. So what were their food ways? <laughs> and um, so first of all, he found that, yes, everyone that had been never gone to the cities had straight teeth, okay? Straight. That means their skull development was ideal. And why did that matter so much to this dentist? Like, who cares? Well, back in the 30s, we didn't have antibiotics. We didn't have safe anesthesia. So if somebody had a tooth that you needed to pull and you wanted to put them under, you might kill them. Or they might just have to be screaming in pain. And as an eight-year-old, that could traumatize you. And you don't want to do that to your patients if you're a kindly gentleman like he was. So it was, it was he cared a great deal about avoiding these seemingly little things that could kill people back before antibiotics. And he, he basically proved that humans have an ideal facial structure that enables them to be free of crooked teeth to accommodate all their, including the wisdom teeth that enabled them to see without needing glasses. I had to have teeth pulled. I obviously need glasses. And that also did a lot of other good things because it wasn't just that you could see without glasses. I mean, imagine if a hunter gatherer couldn't see, did not have perfect 20-20 vision, dead. <laughs> right. Um, so that couldn't happen. So all these things come from ideal growth. It's not incidental. It's not accidental. It is a science. And that's what Weston Price ultimately, like what I love about him the most, in addition to everything I've already said, is that he respected what these people knew. 
because it was miraculous. It was life-giving. It was en it enabled people to grow to be this ideal human in, in terms of their structure, right? I'm not saying in terms of like your personality or your value, or I'm not saying that people don't have that, like myself, <laughs> if, or, you know, if you have glasses, you're not a great human being. You, you, could be, you can have a wonderful heart. But in terms of your capacity to be healthy and really experience the full, like physical meaning of what is it, what are the benefits of being human? That human athlete that we are genetically like programmed and like endowed with the potential there to all be Olympic athletes. But if we don't get nourished properly for too many generations, that goes out the window. And what Price said was that there is knowledge in these people that we need to pay attention to. It will save us because he was he was not just concerned about things like um, teeth. He had a real big picture view. He was also concerned about society and like criminality, like because he he was he he had this idea from going to all these places where that that like health even mental health could be a reflection of your diet like mm -hmm. you know was dependent on your diet and now we know that's perfect that's true it's not a crazy out there idea like we have proof that if you don't get enough omega 3 for example your brain isn't as big if you don't get enough protein uh that sets you up for more learning disorders if you are not breastfed but instead formula fed original junk food formula um if you are not breastfed your iq is lower right so there's all this evidence that is not controverted that what we eat can affect who we are on such a fundamental level it can even affect what our society becomes. And that's what he was also concerned about. And he said that if, uh, if America wants to have a great future, we need to learn more about what these localized pockets of people are eating to be so healthy. And he did his best to collect all that data. And he there's tons in his book, but there was tons more that he collected that was never published and ultimately was stolen. And, you know, now may never be published because of it. But, but I, I, you know, that was, that was everything to me. That was like, this is the answers. This is where this, why didn't I hear about this in medical school? It would have made everything make so much sense. Yeah. This is all the stuff we're struggling with now. Yeah. Well, first, I just want to compliment you on the fact that, you know, you, you have something going on with you. You're like, I'm going to medical school and figuring out what this is. I found something else out. I'm going to become an expert on this field to figure out what it was. That's the kind of energy we need. And just everybody, everybody needs like a smidge of that energy that you just sort of put on display and have demonstrated throughout your life. I find that very impressive and very cool. So guys, everybody out there, if there's something wrong, figure it out. You'll never know where you are, where you'll end up once you just go down a really deep path of trying to trying to learn. The the epigenetic question I asked you was because I wanted to just sort of lay the groundwork for yeah, there is a relationship between what you eat, where you live, the air you breathe, the water you drink, your genes and your gene expression and the health of your of your offspring. And that if you do this uh if if you have a uh, some sort of maladaptive piece and that's in that um, whole milieu you're gonna have bad outcomes and the bad outcomes will be replicated and as i'm reading your book again deep nutrition is one of them the fat burn fix fantastic book rich deep amazing research tons of great stories very well written too i might add um I, the idea of like nutrition based classes uh, or even a nutritionally based sort of race. And and I don't want to like get into like the terrible, scary parts of all that, but there, there, it, it does seem to me, right. That you can walk around and the, the people that are, and I think we can call them victims. I think they are right. Like mid, middle, mid America working hard, no time for research, feeding their kids what they can get their hands on at the local thing. And the whole family's obese, right? Like I, I feel bad for them. 
that is going to be replicated and compounded. And eventually we're just going to have sort of like a biological drift. Do you, do you see that? Or do you feel that? Am I, am I thinking crazy that the, the class divide in America is, is at least manifested nutritionally and then in, in its health or perhaps even driven by it? Well, absolutely. I, I don't think that's crazy. It, it's, it's, something that makes people sometimes uncomfortable, especially the people in power that don't really want you to know that they get really uncomfortable. And then they start, actually, I've been attacked, right? Like, uh, you know, people have called me like, uh, even a Nazi because <laughs> I want to help people know what to eat, to have healthy babies. Right. right. I mean, that is a crazy thing idea that that makes i mean if you think that's what nazism is i think you need to go study history because right. they killed people uh, uh, that were you know jewish or whatever they discerned to be like degenerate go back and read your history because you don't know what you're talking about what i'm trying to do is just get us to what where everyone was a hundred years ago. There's some really great stories I learned doing the research for deep nutrition about um, like grandmothers in Africa who were very upset when missions would come to their town because they knew that really the only way to have a healthy baby was to feed them right. Uh, but you know, that's more work than going to the mission store and eating junk. But their daughters we're having babies that just their the attitude was well if they get sick I'll just take them to the mission you know hospital and they'll take some antibiotics and the grandparents were really upset with that they were like this is not good this is this can't end well and you know so it's not a new idea what I'm saying and it's not controversial I think I mean it is controversial in our very squeamish and weird society it's controversial but it shouldn't be I mean that's part of the problem that's part of like to to make that kind of discussion to put, throw shade on that sort of basic survivalist discussion is bad. That is wrong. Don't do that. We should be elevating this discussion, not trying to suppress it. And it's basic. It's common sense. If you don't feed your children right, it's not going to be as good as if you do. How can that be controversial? So stupid. So you are not, I don't think you're reading into it in a wrong way. I think, I think you're hundred percent. We are down this road already with, with, um, different classes. Like when you said nutrition classes, I thought you were talking about people should take nutrition classes. <laughs> then I realized, oh, you're talking about socioeconomic. Yeah. Oh, well, good. Good topic. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I would love to teach nutrition classes. Um, the, um, yes, we're there. I mean, there's this thing called the social determinants of health, right? Mm. Have you heard that phrase? Mm -mm. I like it. It's, it's kind of a lefty phrase. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's a phrase. Uh, the, what they're doing is they're saying that there's something um, about your socioeconomic level that limits your health, right? That's mm -hmm. an entryway into this very important conversation. Sure. And what they're saying is like, um, it's, it's stuff like, um, uh, well, what they are saying also is what, it's what you eat. And if you've heard the, ter the term food desert before, it comes out of these conversations around people who live in a food desert, which means like your best grocery store is like the dollar store or a 7-Eleven. Like there's no fresh food anywhere within miles. You can't get fresh meat um, or fresh vegetables. And that's a food desert. And they know that people who live in food deserts are destined to be more overweight, have more diabetes, have more mental health disorders, have more difficulty getting a job, finishing, you know, college. Crime. It's not genetic, right? They're yeah. not saying it's genetic, yeah. but the doctors are, the doctors are saying it's genetic. The doctors are saying that African-Americans are just more prone to type two diabetes and obesity and hypertension. That, if you ask me, is racist, but right. uh, I don't want to use that word. Sorry. I don't want to cancel. <laughs> I should cancel. Um, but, but no, I mean, I'm serious that like, that is so short sighted um, there that if people are living in a lower socioeconomic um, environment and they don't have access to good food, they won't be as healthy. That's like so basic. Um, so it's not at all controversial. I mean, it's not at all like, uh, 
it's not taboo if you talk about it with the right words, right? right. If you talk about it in the, in the, with those terms, then you can talk about it. So that's, um, that's why I learned those terms. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> but it's been going on for a long time. I mean, Hawaii. So I, I, I spent 11 years practicing in Hawaii. And in Hawaii, um, you know, there's a thousand year history there. And we only know about the last hundred years or so because it was all oral tradition. But what we know about the last hundred years at, was they were approaching what's called the carrying capacity of the mm. island, the max population that they could feed. And at that point, they were also having different rules about who could eat what. And the royal, it was royalty could eat everything. They could only eat, you know, there were people who could only eat certain foods. And so that is in our human nature, right? It, it, that is like, if we have power, mm -hmm. we want access to the good food. And we're going to, if we're in control, we're going to try and shut down whatever we can to make sure that we get access. So there were certain kinds of fish and bananas was on the list of stuff that, you know, women were not allowed to eat. And um, that is happening now, folks, because right. let me tell you that, well, do you want to hear an example? I, I could just like, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm just going on. I'm this getting is wonderful. probably off the topic. This is long form. Okay. Let's go deep. <laughs> right. That's why, that's, yeah, that's my thing, deep nutrition. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, this is happening in our society because the government says if you can't breastfeed and more than half women now cannot for one reason or another you have to use our processed infant formula our branded infant formula processed food the first three ingredients identical to the first three, three ingredients in milk duds candy protein powder sugar and uh seed oils okay that's what you have to feed your children the American Academy of Pediatricians and every other official society recommends you do not make your own breast milk, uh, make your own formula. The, they say that, in fact, if you do, you might get canceled. I am uh, possibly going to get canceled on Facebook now because I had to defend myself, right? I wrote a post about here's how you want to make if, you know, I, I think you should make your own infant formula because the store-bought stuff, that powder is so toxic. It's so toxic. Uh, how, vegetable oils are bad enough. When you dehydrate them and what they have to do to dehydrate and turn them into a powder, even more toxic. So, um, so make your own. And here's some recipes, right? Well, now Facebook, I just got a notification that says, um, you're under review because that is not something you're supposed to be saying. And they gave me the opportunity to defend myself. I could hit, put one link in to try and defend myself. Jeez. And um, I did. I said, there's organizations that have been saying that, you know, funding from uh, Similac and the companies that make these things, there are people who are pediatricians who've been calling for this process, this, this funding and this conflict of interest to stop because they think it's bad for children's health. And so that was the one link. So we'll see how that one pans out. But, you know, I mean, th this is, this is the society now we live in. We, if, if you don't, conform to the state definition of a healthy diet, you're in trouble. Wow. Misleading information, misleading health information can get you busted. Dr. Kate Shanahan getting thrown in the penalty box for talking about how to feed <laughs> your baby at home with stuff you have at home. Crazy, right? Like, also, go outside, exercise, don't eat a bunch of shitty food, and maybe you won't get as sick from COVID as you might if you're at home stuffed in a box, stuffing your face full of food that comes from a box. Uh, crazy, crazy to me to think that even just basic nutritional information is now on the red list. And uh, welcome to the club, by the way, being called a Nazi. I mean, the, by, by the time they're done with that word, it, it, well, it already doesn't mean anything anymore, but it, it certainly won't mean anything at all uh, because of the way that it gets thrown around. But, you know, I, I can see what they're talking about, right? But it, it's a projection. It's a projection. Um, you know, you want people to be happy and healthy. They, they seemingly, if you judge them by their actions and by uh, the results, want people to be sick. And that's one form of control. That certainly is. Uh, the nutritional races and class development to me is really 
scary and and fascinating and you know i try to share with my children uh, you know remember we live in a bubble like we live in a part of the country where you know various neighborhoods where we've lived have been voted like the fittest neighborhood in america like a number of times right and most people here, depending on whatever part of the political spectrum they're on, because this is not really a right or left kind of thing, they they know, you know, they eat good meat and they don't eat a bunch of shit and they exercise a lot and spend time outside. And guess what? You can see it. It's obvious. And it, it really is a, a class divide. And so when we travel around, you know, there are they are like struck by it's just visually you can just see it. Walking around amidst a different, you know, part of the country, you can just it, see the powerful effect of big farm, big ag, big medicine, big university, all working together to keep us fat, dumb, and sick. One of the things in one of the stories in your book that I was really struck by was the description of like, what would it look like if you were going to Mars? And you were bringing food with you to Mars and you needed stuff to just like sit on the shelf for a long time that didn't need a lot of sunlight, that didn't need fresh air, that didn't need grass, that didn't need to move around. And that's the kind of food that you would bring. And well, that's the kind of food that we're eating now. And, you know, when you put it in that context, it becomes very, very clear to me. Um, I have two big other questions I want to get to. Uh, if you stick with me for a couple for a couple questions more. Um Let's give you an example, and we can talk about how the, would this work. Let's, if we're talking about epigenetics, we're talking about the impact of the environment, your food, on your genes, your gene regulation, expression of your genes, your long-term health, your reproductive health. What, what would you tell a woman, grown woman, whose mom was poor, smoked, gave her bad nutrition, she grows up with asthma, bad eyes, headaches, bad skin, and wants to be more healthy to have healthy babies. Is this something that she can change? And if she makes the changes that you describe in your book, because you say that she can, what, what do they have to do? How long does it take? How long does it take before somebody is ready, you know, to say, I'm now, I've, I've, I've maybe cured myself of this, you know, nutritional legacy that I've been handed. How will I know? that I am able to now reproduce, say, in the most optimal way. And now this is not just for women. It was just like the first example that came to mind. Same thing for men, you know, the same cycle for your environment and the food, whatnot, it affects your sperm. And since you're making sperm all the time, they're probably even more susceptible to the ongoing changes, right? Because it's in real time. Uh, so to talk, talk us through that, because this is, seems like a really powerful thing. I, I know people want to give their kids the best chance that they can and, I know people are much more calculated these days about when and how they're having children and whatnot. How does this work? How do you cure yourself of your nutritional legacy? What do you, what are the signs that you have done it? And when do you know you're ready then to give your kids the best foot forward? Well, first I know there are people asking that question. It's a very important question. Probably the most important you can ask because it's going to affect your child for the rest of their lives. It truly will. Um, and congratulations for even asking, because there's not a lot in our culture that would make you do that, just your own kind of thinking, right? Um, and uh, the answer is we don't have like a lot of, no one's really studying it. So uh, my best, I can give you like my educated guesses, right? Okay, fair. So things that I would really recommend that you um, get straight are you know stop eating the seed oils because those things are incompatible with you being healthy um, in the long term and certainly incompatible with uh, having an ideal child development they're, they're very inflammation promoting and child development is so easily disrupted by inflammation um, so you want to get the seed oils out of your diet and you want them out also though. I mean, the thing is the seed oils build up in your body fat. So they're there for at least like a year and a half, mm. right? Until uh, after you stop eating them. Um, so you want to get those things out as soon as you possibly can. And, uh, the, the thing like, so people might be thinking, okay, well, I'm, say I'm like, my biological clock is ticking. What I can tell you is that avoiding 
the seed oils and optimizing your nutrition basically reverses your biological clock. I mean, people will have irregular, I say this because people will be infertile and or have irregular periods or have uh, problems with their ovaries like polycystic ovarian disease. And they will reverse all of this with a healthy diet. They will start having their periods again. I have worked with women who thought they went through menopause early and they mm. got on a healthy diet and they got their periods back. They weren't like the most thrilled about that, but, <laughs> but, you know, but it's a good sign of like, you know, vitality and youth. Um, and then when they had menopause again, it wasn't like a big deal. There was like no hot flashes or anything. Like it was easier. Um, so, uh, so getting the seed oils out of your diet, just like knowing how long you've been avoiding seed oils, like that's key, right? You don't need any tests for that. Um, just need good eyesight. So you can read all those little tiny ingredients on the label. Um, but, uh, so that's like a year and a half, I would say, maybe minimum of avoiding those and also trying to eat healthy. Okay. But what are some objective things you can look for? Uh, well, I would like to know that you have a normal insulin sensitivity. And I, I have links on my website on how you can get an insulin sensitivity test, because even though it's like literally the, probably the most important single blood test you can get, um, it, doctors don't even know how to order it. So you can go to a walk-in lab and get the test done. And so I, I have links on my website on what that is and how to find like the whole process. So insulin sensitivity is an indicator that you are sensitive to hormones. Insulin insensitivity, insulin is a hormone, right? It's the hormone that helps us, right? One of the key hormones that helps us regulate our blood sugar levels. Diabetics, type one diabetics need to inject themselves with insulin because uh, they don't have any and it's necessary to get the sugar in your bloodstream out of your bloodstream and where it needs to go. So if, but seed oils in your body, they cause insulin resistance. Um, insulin insensitivity. So that means your body has to produce a lot more insulin and it still doesn't even work very well. So you can actually test for that. It's called a HOMA IR test and it's simple blood test fasting, go in fasting in the morning. That's probably the single most important test. If you have a normal HOMA, an abnormal HOMA IR and you're not insulin, normally insulin sensitive, that is a strong indication you're not normally sensitive to all the other hormones that you need to be normally sensitive to, to have a healthy baby and even to have pregnancy not be dangerous for yourself or painful, right? Because um, diabetes type two is a disease of insulin resistance. And we know diabetes type two and prediabetes and insulin resistance put women at risk of pregnancy complications for themselves, not just for their children. And I'm talking about like preeclampsia, which used to kill women, um, but it's associated with uh, high high blood pressure and um, you know needing a cesarean section early to get your baby out of there before the baby dies. Um, and I'm talking about other things like um, things that could kill the mom, like like uh, the placenta not having the right sensitivity to hormones to end up in the right place in the uterus. So the placenta is that big mushy blob of blood that's like the afterbirth that basically you know sucks nutrition out of mom's body and gives it to baby through the umbilical cord that's the placenta so that thing needs to be in the right place if it's in the wrong place once your uterus starts to dilate it will tear and you will bleed to possibly to death if you're not able to do anything about it because if, if it's over that bottom part of the uterus in the way of the baby coming out, it's just all messed up. So it has to be, you know, it's supposed to be on top of the uterus and it moves around, right? It's creepy, but it, it can start out in one place and then like migrate around to the top where it actually belongs. But it has to be, um, it has to be, you have to have, it has to be directed by hormones and a lot of other chemicals that the seed oils and high blood sugar levels will disrupt. And so that's the reason why we have all these pregnancy complications and cesarean births required now because we don't have normal sensitivity to our own hormones. But that's why I like the HOMA IR as a test to make sure you know you're good um, for having a baby.
Gotcha. Well, it's being deliberate. We're deliberate with so many things. People will spend a year researching what kind of car to buy, you know, or shop for a year on like what new couch they're going to get or look for a house for three years, right? Neighborhood. You know, I, I encourage people to put some thought behind the timing. If they haven't been eating healthy, which a lot of our guys and a lot of our listeners have, because this is, you know, we, we are like you, we want answers. We go out there, we find them, we dig through studies and research and make sense of the world in order to come up with something healthy, because we all have a sneaking suspicion that the party line that you're getting on just about everything is pretty whack. And so take some time to also figure out when you're going to have a baby. Cause it is not only do you want to save money for college or, you know, if you're going to do that, uh, provide them, put them in a great neighborhood, but kick them off the, on the right foot, uh, nutritionally and healthily and healthily. It's a great word. Uh, and, uh, ep epigenetically, uh, as it were, and you know, it's powerful. It's powerful. Just letting some of that soak in for a minute. There's really so many things out there trying to get you. And I don't mean people. I just mean like bad food and bad oils and bad diet and bad ideas, and bad this, and bad that. And if you don't just put the time into learning, you're going to be behind. And that's going to be a class divide for people moving forward, irrespective of race, irrespective of gender, it will be a divide. Are you going to listen to the bad stuff and go down the bad path? Are you going to put in the effort to figure out what's good and what's healthy for you? And you're, you're doing God's work here, putting this stuff out there and yeah. doing the research and putting it together in an easily digestible uh, format. But I imagine in doing so you're, you're okay. making perhaps some enemies along the way, Dr. Kate, what, what have your critics, besides Nazi, what do they say about you? I mean, what is, what, what, so tell us the craziest thing people are saying about you. <clears throat> and then actually um, offer up one of the criticisms that you've heard that's, that was pretty reasonable, but you have a good rebuttal for. Okay, let's see here. So one of the ones that I guess it maybe is the craziest, I mean, it kind of bothers me the most. Um, <clears throat> and that is the idea that health is better than disease has been attacked. Mm. Like when I, you know, the book, um, Deep Nutrition is all about trying to promote health. So is it Bob and Vicks. Um, but the comments come from people who may have children who are afflicted with diseases and they just don't want to think of that as bad. Like they want to, they want to, you know, generally be able to think of it as like a gift, right? Because they're trying, it's, it can be hard and they're trying to cope with it. Mm. So it's great as a coping strategy, but when you start like attacking folks for trying to prevent that sort of thing from happening to a child. Is this the that, context of autism? That's where, especially autism, yeah. yes, especially. Um, because I, I really feel like, um, there's a, is a very interesting community there. I mean, it's one of the most difficult, um, diseases that, uh, well, it, like, I mean, they wouldn't want to call it a disease, but it's, it, uh, it's a disease. I'm sorry. Um, it's not normal. You need, you need, your child needs support. You know, you need lots of extra teaching support and that's okay. It doesn't make you a bad mom. It just means that um, some mothers might want to prevent that. And some children might have wished for, like, I know I would have wished for my for better health, right? And, uh, and I'm fairly functional. Um, so think about it from, I would ask that they would think about it from the child's perspective. Anyway, I'm so gonna, like I'm that gonna, is I'm kind of I'm going to interrupt like, you here because right? I had this one written down and I didn't ask it. But now that we're here, I'm going to ask it. Uh, do you think, right. do you attribute uh, autism to the prevalence of uh, seed oils in the diet? Oh, hugely. I mean, I have a chapter in the new edition of Deep Nutrition. I call, uh, it's called Brain Killer, how vegetable oil is your brain's worst enemy. And it truly is. And there's many ways that um, the mechanisms of how seed oil promotes inflammation and disrupts our growth that uh, are right in line with what happens with autistic children's neurological development. Um, and, you know, some people call um, Alzheimer's autism of the elderly, right? Because there's similar findings there that have to do with infl inflammation. 
and seed oils promote inflammation. So it, absolutely it's related and, and absolutely it's, you can do something and like every day that you don't eat seed oils before you have a child is before you conceive is a good, is a good thing. Um, and it's both men and women actually really, you know, matters. Like you said, in real time, it, um, it doesn't possibly take quite so long for, for guys to experience the benefits because, um, it's more in real time. Um, but, uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so absolutely I do. And, and, you know, this isn't to blame mothers for saying you should have known this. This is, you know, to put it out there that there is something you can do. And if anybody's to blame, it's the American Heart Association because they're the ones that have been pushing seed oils. Uh, right. And, um, and, and, you know, not physicians. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's really the doctor's responsibility to like, it's really hard to, to learn the truth about nutrition. It's not like somebody asked me once, is it like just a little bit more learning that doctors have to do? Or is this a really big deal? I thought it was a really smart question. It's not like doctors are just like so lazy that we, we don't even read the basics about nutrition. No way. We are so indoctrinated and it's so dangerous as a doctor to you know, actually dispense healthy dietary information, I couldn't practice anymore. And, and like that kind of is one of your other questions, right? You were asking like, what do people say about it? So I know that like uh, other doctors think I'm crazy, right? Because I'm not prescribing statins all the time because I tell people with type two diabetes that there is something you can do to reverse your diabetes. And it, it you know, it's not all about carbohydrates either. It's, it's about these seed oils, big, hugely, huge, huge um, influence. And um, so, yeah, so like that was part of why it, it was hard for me to continue in regular practice because I was expected to cover for my colleagues and their patients would come in and they would uh, need refills on diabetes prescriptions or cholesterol drugs. And I just felt like morally obligated to say, hey, you know, there's another way at least. and like some people wanted to hear it and some people didn't that's fine but if my colleagues had had their way i wouldn't say that right and and that was hard because like i respected these people but they just couldn't go down the rabbit hole with me you know right. and get on board so that that was tough yeah i can imagine uh, it's as with a lot of these things where we've been told one thing, indoctrinated, and the establishment is behind something that's wrong, uh, it takes a lot to move people off that position, whether it's political, whether it's uh, nutrition, you know, who knows what it is. In, in a lot of cases, especially politically, I've seen it takes a, like a, a traumatic event. Uh, where finally, finally, you can no longer be in denial that the model that you have in your head isn't providing you the value that you need, the utility as it interfaces with reality. And uh, it, it's hard when you see people who you otherwise respect and, and know are smart people and are kind and caring and, and don't want to be bad people and, and aren't, you know, but may still be enthralled to a outdated model. Uh, of perceiving the world, uh, whatever the domain may be. And, uh, you know, the, there's a reason why, you know, the pioneer has an arrow in the back, right? Like you're out there on the frontier and it's dangerous and not everybody's with you and it's fraught with danger and criticism and, and risk. And, you know, it, that's probably why people don't go there. It's why people don't go there. Right. Right. Do you have, do you have yes, hope? Yes. Well, well I, I sort of do. Yes. I mean, I was going to say, especially in medicine, because we are always like, there's always the sharks swirling, the, the lawyers, right? Yeah. And the insurance companies and the medical board and all these people who are trying to, um, I mean, if you, if you step outside of a line, you can get dinged by any one of them. And there's all these pressures that our society puts on doctors to just conform. And I've heard from, you know, people that had to engage with our own doctors now in the regular medical system. And a lot of the time they just feel like 
they're robots. You know, that I've spoken with doctors who felt like they were asked to be robots and they just couldn't do it. So they had to find another way of practicing. And, um, you know, I, 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 I have hope for these alternative ways of practicing, right? There are a lot of doctors now who are, I'm going to say enlightened because it's really the word around nutrition and, um, and have gone out on their own in one fashion or another, but it's not always easy. There's not a lot of business models. Like you can't necessarily just be in the regular insurance, uh, rat race. Um, and so it requires like cash payments and stuff, which some, Folks like myself are just kind of queasy about doing it that way, but um, I mean, other, otherwise you can't do it at all, you know. But um, you know, I'm hoping that there will be more of actually the solution that my current boss considered, which my current boss is a is like the the son of the CEO of a company. What is what does that mean? That means I'm a company doc. That the employees of the company don't need to have health insurance and I can help them. In, and I can help in them house as long doctor as they instead of in-house counsel. Yeah. In- interesting. Interesting concept. Con- it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. concierge ish, I guess. It is concierge, yeah. but uh, like for free. So, uh, right. you know, so right. Right. <laughs> they just pay me a doctor's salary. Right. But instead I'm delivering, you know, much better quality than they can get in the insurance system. That's tremendous. I have a colleague, Dr. Phil Ovadia. He is a heart surgeon. He's done over 3,000 heart surgeries, but he's made it his mission now to keep people off the operating table. And he's very focused on uh-huh. metal. Med- oh, you know, Phil. Oh, okay, great. And uh, yeah. he, you know, he's, he's doing something similar now too. Um, you know, trying not to fly around the country, cracking people open who are, who are sick, but try to keep people from getting sick in the first place. And, you know, unfortunately, well, amazing. Lovely. I support it a thousand percent. Unfortunately, that doesn't help with the widening, the widening divide in some cases. Um, but writing yeah. does putting out books like this, yeah. fat burn fix. There we go. Oh, I don't have the dust jacket here, but deep nutrition. Cause I went deep into this one. The dust jacket got lost along the way. Um, tremendous books. Uh, I love your perspective and your outlook. Uh, I love the energy that you brought to your work. I think that you didn't say, you know, I got into medicine to make a bunch of money says it all. You got into medicine to figure out how to help yourself and now others. And that, that, that fuel is probably what, you know, helps keep you moving forward in face of people calling you Nazi and, uh, you know, some sort of evil, you know, bad genetic manipulator and whatnot. When really all you want people to do is to like eat sauerkraut and like eat the meat off the bone and like have a fresh salad from your garden without a bunch of shitty salad dressing on it. It's not, it's not that crazy. It's not that crazy. Uh, and, and the fact that we have to return to these eternal truths is also mirrored in other elements of our lives, right? In philosophy, like go back to the Aristotelian excellences. They've been there for 2,500 years. It's not brand new information. We just have to return to it. So. Congratulations to you on that. And thank you very much for coming on the show. I have a million more questions. Maybe we can do this again sometime. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kate, Catherine Shanahan. Sorry, I keep calling you Dr. Kate. I don't know why. Dr. Shanahan. Um, thank you very much. That's my brand. That's the Perfect. Okay. Thank you for inviting me onto your show. Thank you. Yeah, Pleasure. It's, it's been wonderful. Guys, here's what it is, everybody. Uh, the book, Deep Nutrition. Get this one. Get the Fat Burn Fix. Uh, also, we didn't get to it, but we'll talk about it at some point. Uh, Zero Acre, please check that out. It's one of uh, their ways of trying to put a solution into this problem. Uh, but we'll do that another time. Thank you very much. Um, where um, can we send people to find out more about you to your website? You know, plug whatever you'd like. Yeah, so my website is drkate.com, D-R-C-A-T-E dot com. And I'm also on social media. Um, it's uh, the at sign, uh, Dr. Kate Shanahan. But you can go to my website and their links are there. <laughs> but I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, and I'm on Facebook. For now. Um, 
So yeah, love to see you there. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kate. Appreciate it. And uh, I will talk to you soon. All right, everybody. Uh, that's going to be a wrap for this one. This was Jack Murphy Live number 90, Dr. Catherine Sh uh, Shanahan, Deep Nutrition. Please do check it out. It's like the red pill nutrition uh, on top of all the other ones that we've been looking at. And uh, I really appreciate her coming on. If you follow me, uh, follow me on Twitter at Jack Murphy Live. You know, hit subscribe here on YouTube when we broadcast this. Also subscribe on whatever podcast you're listening to. And if you're interested in uh, masculine, masculinity, brotherhood, and sovereignty, come join our fraternity, the Liminal Order, liminal-order.com. And uh, join the list and find out what it's all about. Until then... Uh, we'll see you the next time.